Rosalie Rayner collaborated with John Watson on the infamous Little Albert study, and her affair with him resulted in the end of his academic career. But was she a villain in this story, or a victim? Today, we tell the untold story of Rosalie Rayner. Stay tuned. Little Albert is one of the fabled classic studies we tell every student of psychology. If you've seen our video on Little Albert, then you're probably better informed than most, and may agree that the story isn't great, but isn't as grim as people usually make it out to be. But there's more to the story than just the experiment. A tale of jealousy, affairs, salacious rumors, childhood trauma, and even suicide. So strap in for a bumpy ride. We're going to explore the real dark side of the private lives of the researchers behind Little Albert. This is the true story of Rosalie Rayner. Before she became famous for her involvement with John B. Watson, psychology's famous father of behaviorism, Rayner was born in 1899 to a wealthy and well-known family in Boston. In 1919, before the age of 20, she had already graduated from Vassar College. Now, we don't know a lot about her life before this, but she must have been doing fairly well to land a position in the lab of the already famous John Watson. A few things you should know about Watson. He was handsome, he was in his early 40s, he was married, and he was a known womanizer. That is, being married didn't seem to bother him when it came to starting affairs with women. And his wife wasn't happy about it, but this was her lot in life, so she soldiered on. When Rosalie came into the lab, she was excited to work with all the kids at Johns Hopkins Hospital where Watson was conducting research. She's reported to have studied over 500 babies during this time, including the study with Little Albert, published in 1920, and her work became the basis for their popular book on parenting, published in 1928. When she came to his lab, she was 19, and he was 42, and it wasn't long before he became infatuated with her. Now, his wife assumed this flame would burn out just as the others had, but to her chagrin, it didn't. Rayner's father wasn't pleased with the situation either and threatened to cut her off financially. As a businessman, he was also a big donor to Johns Hopkins Hospital, where they did their research. The scandal blew up everywhere, and copies of Watson's love letters to the other woman were leaked to the press and published in the papers. The bad publicity resulted in Watson's fall from grace, and he left academia and went on to use his behaviorist principles in the advertising business. But despite these problems, Watson and Rayner were married on January 3rd, 1921. On November 21st of the same year, they gave birth to a bouncing baby boy of their own, Billy. Two years later, they would have another boy, James, and this is how the Watson family came to be. Their approach to parenting was not dissimilar from their approach to their treatment of babies in the laboratory. They thought of parenting as a scientific enterprise, and they took careful notes and made observations about the kids. And they believed in strict behaviorist principles, pure use of reward and punishment to guide behavior, and being careful about forming unwanted or unnecessary attachments. So they were far removed from concepts like love, comfort, or affection. In their book, they go as far as to suggest that children may be better off if they don't know who their own parents are, and call motherly love a, quote, dangerous instrument which could inflict a never healing wound, a wound which may make infancy unhappy, adolescence a nightmare, and an instrument which may wreck your adult son's or daughter's vocational future and their chance for future happiness. So yeah, not many hugs going around in the Watson household. Now, when I use the word they, you got to take that with a grain of salt, because while it seems that Rosalie was all in on the behaviorist approach to parenting at the start, at least, later correspondence suggests she may have run into some problems with this along the way. At that time, the family usually followed the husband's will, and there wasn't much room for input. In any case, she tried to begin classically conditioning baby Billy's bowel movements to start bathroom training at three months old, which didn't really work. She made notes that indicated when he was beginning to show, quote, sensitivity of erogenous zones, and other notes that you might expect from a clinically detached laboratory researcher rather than a loving household. Billy and Jimmy were not allowed to cuddle or fight so that they would not become dependent on each other. At ages one and three, they were allowed to shake hands at bedtime. 
Jimmy would later report that they were never kissed or held and remembers his mother as an unaffectionate and willing participant in these home experiments to make their children well-adjusted and independent. James couldn't remember a time when his mom and dad disagreed with each other or argued, and at the time she did disagree, went along ultimately with John's plan. However, in 1930, she wrote an article in Parents Magazine as the sole author, and she was very back and forth about behaviorism and critical of behaviorism in practice in the home. It was titled, I am the mother of a behaviorist sons. In the article, she talks about the many ways she disagrees with behaviorist principles of parenting and suggests she often argues with John about how to raise the kids. She couldn't completely hide her love for the kids and said, many personal resentments have grown up within me in respect to strict behaviorism being practiced in our home. She described herself as being the very worst behaviorist and wanting to, quote, break all the rules. So she seems to have been conflicted. On the one hand, wanting to be a good mother, as defined by the detachment of behaviorism, and on the other hand, a human longing to embrace and love and dote on her children. But the influence of her husband won out, according to the children themselves. Eventually, Harry Harlow's 1958 experiments with monkeys, wire mother, cloth mother, would dispel behaviorist notions about food and reinforcement, showing how critically important parental comfort is to infant primates. But by then, it was already too late. Rosalie Rayner Watson had been an up-and-coming researcher in psychology, and I can't help but wonder, were it not for her romantic involvement with Watson, what would she have become? She might have well been one of the most influential female scientists in the history of psychology. Some would argue she already is. But would she have been known solely for her questionable experiments with little Albert and as a side note in Watson's scandal? Or would she have gone on to do great things had she not been sidetracked as a teenager by an influential man twice her age? Unfortunately, we'll never know. When Watson left Johns Hopkins, she went with him and never finished her graduate degree. In the summer of 1936, at 36 years old, Rosalie Rayner ate some fruit imported from South America and got sick with dysentery and quickly wasted away. This reportedly devastated Watson, which some say contributed to the negative tone of his autobiography, which he was writing at the time. And according to James, Dad just withdrew completely and he was lost. He didn't know what to do with his children and didn't really know how he was going to function. It was really a very tragic thing for him. I have no doubt that dad went through a very serious depression after mother's death and he took a long time to come out of it. What about the kids? What happened to Billy and Jimmy? Are you sure you want to know? Okay. <laughs> William, aka Billy, became a psychologist, but it's not what you think. What is the one thing a behaviorist hates most? Their raison d'etre. Their very reason for existence? To fight Freudian psychodynamics. So guess what Billy became? That's right, he was a Freudian psychiatrist. This bothered his father endlessly, and they became estranged. Apparently they made up to some extent before Watson's death in 1958, but a few years later, Billy would take his own life. James blamed his brother's death in large part on their behavioristic upbringing, which did not give them the, quote, ability to deal effectively with human emotion. James would write, Children simply cannot grow emotionally and develop a reasonably strong foundation as adults to cope with the world. They won't have the ability to love and be loved and to develop a respectable level of self-esteem, which is essential to growth. Jimmy also tried to commit suicide, but was helped through psychotherapy to continue on living. The biggest experts in behaviorism had done their best to run a strict behaviorist household 24-7 to create the ultimate in psychologically healthy, well-adjusted, independent children, and they had failed. In 2014, a second article authored by Rosalie Rayner alone was discovered, the only two known to be authored by her alone. This time, it was in the magazine Psychology, and it was published in 1932. Now, John Watson had never had problems sharing his views on feminism and the women's movement, and we'll just say he was less than progressive. For example, he wrote that women haven't enough to do today. Scientific mass production has made their tasks so easy that they are overburdened with time, which they use to destroy the happiness of their children. Yikes. But Rayner did find her own voice for this article. 
What Future Has Motherhood? In it, she describes a number of problems faced by women, such as the expectations to be the stay-at-home matriarch of the family, yet be attendant to their husbands alone when they get home rather than to the kids, and the mounting social pressure to work outside the home. She argued that we need to restructure society to have better support for child rearing to allow women to have careers and social lives. Her idea to solve this problem was to create institutes to train young women to be child caretakers, and those institutes could serve as temporary homes when parents were away or people needed babysitting. Rayner wrote that she worried about who she left the kids with, but, quote, when I am convinced of their proficiency and kindness, I resign them cheerfully to them, except for executive supervision. Then I plunge wholeheartedly into whatever I want to do. It may be nightclubs and dancing, three hours a day at the beauty parlor, tennis, writing now and then, even flirting a little, and not always with my husband. Motherhood to me, consequently, is not a bore. It is just one of the many things that makes life amusing and joyous. Uh, since we know how this story ends, I'm not sure it's much to be proud of, but it does suggest that Rosalie was part of a growing push for the independence of women from being shackled to traditional ideas of motherhood, family, and patriarchal norms. And of course, now we've figured out how to balance pressure on women between the ideal of female domesticity, motherhood, and a desire for a life and career outside the home. The women just do all of it. What about the rumor? What rumor? At the beginning, you mentioned a salacious rumor. I've been waiting for that this whole time. Oh, yeah. There was a salacious rumor that one of the reasons Watson and Rayner got together was that they were doing secret experiments on the human sexual response in the laboratory. The rumor says that Watson had devised a machine to measure female arousal, and they hooked Rayner up to the machine, and the pair then had sex. This story, where Rosalie becomes a guinea pig in Watson's sex experiments, was especially perpetuated by a shit stirrer named James V. McConnell, who really needs his own video about all his shenanigans, but he had heard it from some people close to the Watsons. Later, he discovered a few gynecological tools in a collection of items from Watson's lab, which was confirmation enough for him. Others weren't so convinced, however. Now, we do know that Watson had an interest in sex and sexual behavior and in the psychology and physiology of sex, and he mentioned this in a number of his personal and professional communications. However, if it were true that he had experimented along these lines, he most likely would have mentioned that when he wrote to his friends in private letters on those matters. So this suggests that the rumors are probably just that, rumors, and Watson never did any kind of research like this in his lab. So that's the story of Rosalie Rayner. Was she a willing co-pilot for ethically questionable practices in the laboratory and in the home? Or was she unduly influenced by a powerful older man and given little agency in her life? Was she a brilliant scientist who was silenced? Or was she a feminist voice that had pushed society forward? Maybe she was all of the above. Either way, I hope you've enjoyed hearing her story as much as I enjoyed sharing it. If you like this video, please hit the like button. We've got more videos featuring the stories of women in psychology with links in the description. So check those out. Consider subscribing for more videos on all things psychology. And until next time, keep thinking. Should a child be allowed to take a toy to bed? Good question. If the child doesn't go to sleep at once, it has something to play with. And since it wakes up in the morning before it is allowed to get up, it again has something to play with. It is therefore less likely to explore its own body. Okay, let's 